Peter chapter 2, 13 to 25 is our main text for this morning. I'd like to invite everyone to please stand. 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 to 25. But we will only read verses to, uh, 13 to 22. Let's begin. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but leaving as servants to God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are bitten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. May the Lord add blessings ring of his words. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you that we could gather this morning, worship you, express our love to you through songs. Thank you for being so gracious and merciful to all of us, allowing us to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. I pray that you would open our hearts to listen to your words. I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to teach us this morning. For this is our prayer in Christ's most wonderful name. Amen and amen. How many of you are familiar with Roger Stovak? probably the older ones, Roger Stoback. He led the Dallas Cowboys to five world championships during the late 60s and early 70s. Now, what's interesting about Roger Stoback was that he admitted that as a quarterback who's not allowed to call plays in the game was really a test of his character. Why? Because he had a great coach, Tom Laundry. if you can still remember. Tom always sets in the play. He told Roger when to, when to pass, when to run. He made sure that everything is dictated in the game as he has, you know, perceived how it should go. Roger was never allowed to change the place. He can only call and change it in times of emergencies, but he better be right whenever he makes those calls. Now, it was so hard for Roger Stovak. He felt that although he considers his coach as a genius in football, but his pride was telling him that as a quarterback, he should have the right to also call the place for the game. But then later, he said these words. He said, I face to the issue of obedience. Once I'd learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Now, I think about those words and I realize that Roger Stovak is not the only one who struggles with obeying authorities. That is something that you and I struggle with because of the sinfulness of our heart. You and I have a greater propensity to rebel rather than obey. To rebel rather than submit to authorities. But just like what Roger Stovak said, 
the only time he truly had experienced harmony, fulfillment, and victory is when he had learned to submit. And, and I trust that this would at least help us understand what the Bible has been talking about all along. You see, last Sunday, during the preaching of Pastor Dan, he talked about rebelliousness. And, and the main text that he used was Numbers chapter 16. Now, if you're not familiar with Numbers chapter 16, I trust that you would find time to read it. Why? Because it talks about Korah together with 250 well-known leaders of Israel rebelling against Moses and Aaron. They, they literally, you know, tried a mutiny, a revolution. They wanted to accuse Moses and Aaron of exalting themselves above all the people of Israel. They thought they were equal to Moses and Aaron. But then if you look at the chapter, God expressed his displeasure to the point that Korah, together with their family members, plus about 14,700 people were destroyed by the Lord because of their rebellious spirit. Now, sometimes you and I do not consider rebellion as something we should be seriously thinking about or a warning that you and I should heed. But time and again, when you go back to the Scriptures, the Lord is giving us some instructions that here are some attitudes that we need to watch that we don't fall into because they can destroy us. Now, there's a word in the New Testament found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. And, and this verse is really in the context of the wilderness wandering. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he was telling, me, he was telling them that all of these stories during the wilderness wanderings were recorded in order for them to wise up, in order for them to have the instructions that they need as they live their Christian lives at that time. And this is what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And so the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian Christians, they were really recorded for our example so that we could have the necessary instruction. And, and for the past several Sundays in our theme, Seeking to Change My Attitude, we have looked at some of the negative attitudes of the Israelites and suggested that we should be able to replace them with some attitudes that would help us experience the Lord's, the Lord's blessings today. Last Sunday was rebellious spirit. This morning, as a substitute to replace rebellion, we should talk about submission. Being in a submissive attitude. Now, there are three vital components of submission that we would find in 1 Peter or 1 Peter chapter 2. Just a small explanation of the context of 1 Peter chapter 2. When the Apostle Peter wrote his epistle to the churches, he understood that he was writing to Christians who were severely persecuted by the Roman Empire because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if that was the situation, perhaps Peter could have told them, you know, you have all the right to rebel because of the way you're being treated. Nope. You'd realize that the main teaching in our passage is an encouragement for them to continually submit despite what they're going through. 
And, and that is something that would blow our minds, right? Meaning, we're already suffering, and you're telling us to just endure. And, and that's what you would see in our text this morning. And, and as I've said, there are three things that we need to understand. Here's the first one, the duty of submission. When you read verse 13, you would realize that you and I had been given the responsibility to submit ourselves to an absolute authority. And who is that absolute authority? No other than the Lord. The verse reads, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and then the first part of verse 14, or to the governors. Let's stop there. Now, the word subject or submit in this particular verse comes from a military term which means to arrange in a military fashion under the commander. So if you're familiar with the military, what the Apostle Peter is saying, you have a commander-in-chief and you should be willing to operate within you know, the authority given to the chain of command. Now, as believers, our commander-in-chief is very clear. It's the Lord. That's why in the passage, it says, be subject for the Lord's sake. Now, for the Lord's sake should be understood as a reminder that our ultimate motivation in our obedience to human institutions is our desire to submit to the ultimate authority or to the absolute authority that belongs only to God. Amen? Now, please notice that the verse talks about human institutions. What are these human institutions? Let me just reiterate this to you. We talked about this already last Sunday. First, you have the family, and within the family, husbands are to be the head and parents over their children. You see scriptures, Ephesians chapter 5, 21 to 29, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 4, Colossians chapter 3. So in all of this human institutions, I would mention, there are corresponding passages that, you know, we would not have the opportunity to definitely read this morning, but hopefully when you go home, when you review our sermon notes, which we send to you on a regular basis, notice that they are established in the scriptures very clearly. Family, and then you have the government leaders, and then the church that has been given leaders, elders or pastors and deacons, and then employers. So God has instituted all of this human authorities, but it's important for us to understand these human authorities are given the privilege to, you know, provide direction, provide guidance to the people under them. But their authority is not coming from them personally. The authority comes from the Lord. And so when they begin to, you know, command something that would go against the Lord, then it's the Lord's authority we obey, not the human institution. For example, if the mayor of Randolph or the governor of New Jersey would tell us we cannot worship, then we're going to have a problem because we are mandated by the Lord to worship. If they're beginning to tell us that we cannot pray, we cannot study the Bible, then we're going to have a problem. Why? Because their authority given to them by the Lord stops when 
they disobey what the Lord has given us as His people. That should be clear for all of us. Right? But as long as they are not disobeying the Lord's command, then we have to be respectful of the authorities that God has given us. Why? Because this provides order and safety in our communities. It provides uh, order in such a way that it demonstrates the very character of God. Now, God is a God of order. But within the order that God has established in certain structures, like in a society, in a family, He has given people certain level of authorities. But submission to authorities does not make anyone inferior or lesser. How do we know this? Well, God himself is a perfect illustration. We all know that within God's purposes to save humanity, the Father sent Jesus Christ into the world. We see this very clearly in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. In order for Him to be the Savior and Redeemer. After the Lord Jesus Christ has finished His work, went back to heaven, and then the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to apply the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to minister and empower the people who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Father sent Jesus Christ, and then later the Father and Jesus Christ would send the Holy Spirit to accomplish the purposes that they themselves had established. And so within that order, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit were obedient, but they were never inferior to the Father. Or the Holy Spirit was never inferior to Jesus Christ. Why? Because we believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all equal. Right from the very beginning up to eternity, you know, future. They will remain to be equal in power, equal in character. So, if you're thinking, if I obey, does that make me inferior? No. You're simply obeying and following the order that God has established. And when we rebel, the result would be chaos and complications in this structures that God has established. That's why when you go to the scriptures, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, the context of this would be, you know, wives, submit to your husbands, husbands, love your wives, children, obey your parents. In the book of Ephesians, this particular passage begins with this word, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, Every single one has a role of submission. Wife, husband, children, servants, submit to one another. No one is exempted. All of us has the responsibility, the duty to submit. Now, number two, not only the duty of submission, but the defense of submission. You see, when, when the Lord ordained these human institutions and were asked to submit to them, our submission is not to burden us, but rather God has designed that our submission is for our protection and welfare. How do we know this? Well, go back to the text, verses 14 and 15. It says, or to governors... As sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, 
that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So, as Peter continues his word to the church, he mentions the twofold function of the judicial system. What are they? Number one is to punish those who do evil. So, with these words, to punish those who are evil, God is authorizing the government to punish law offenders. Right? So, in a society where human beings have the sinful nature, and because of that, they have the potential of rebelling against laws, God has said, when you violate the laws, then you ought to be punished. Unfortunately, nowadays, that's a real problem in our society. Why? Because there are governments who are doing their best to rehabilitate law offenders without punishing them. And that leads to more crimes. Because law offenders who get away from offending the laws would definitely, you know, not be restrained in repeating their offenses. But the Bible says we have to punish those who violate the law. So, if you go to countries where they implement this, you know, punishment of offenders of the law, like if you go to Japan, you can walk around wearing your jewelry and you don't have the, the problem of probably being mugged, or Singapore where you'd be fined for everything if you try to throw something, you know, not on the trust bins, you're going to be fine. That's, it's a city of fine. So, so you have all of these countries where they would surely be punished and people are more careful to violate the laws because they know they're going to get it. And it's biblical to punish those who do evil. But at the same time, there's also the positive side of it. To praise those who do good. So you're, you're not, as a government, you should not just be punishing, punishing, punishing. You ought to find opportunities to also commend those who are doing good. Why? Because here's the tendency. Even if you're a parent and you have kids, if you only are good in punishing and you're not commending and praising your kids, you're not helping your kids to develop good behaviors. Why? Because when you're commended doing good, chances are you're going to choose to repeat behaviors that's getting positive recognition. Get me? And if governments, if societies are commending and praising those people who are law-abiding citizens, then you would be able to establish, you know, communities which are livable, which are more peaceful and safe for people to live in. So twofold responsibility of the government, to punish those who do evil and commend those or praise those who do good. Now, then the Apostle Peter says, for this is the will of God. Now think about it. What's God's will? Well, if you continue to read, it says that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now let me explain that. God's will is for us to continually submit to the government because that's the only way we could convince people who are undermining our faith. As I've told you, 
during this time, Christians were being persecuted. And those who are persecuting believers are being referred to by the Apostle Peter as foolish people. Why? Because they're going against God in persecuting Christians just like Paul when he started out as Saul. But then, according to Peter, it is God's will that you continue to do good, submit to the government, why? Because this is the only way foolish people could be silenced. Meaning, that's the only way you could prove to people that your faith is worth having. Or your faith is genuine because of your attitude towards human authorities. That's quite clear, right? So, as, as God's children... You and I need to understand. I have the responsibility to be submissive, not only because it is God's will, not only because I do it for God, but I'm establishing a better testimony to the people around me who's watching me, who wants to see what my faith is really like. You see, when you go to your workplace, for example, and... They know you as a Christian, but you're the one who's constantly complaining. You're, you're the one who's always making an issue to the HR, right, Ajay? That's not a good testimony. That's not the way to silent the people who are watching you who needs to see a good testimony of faith. Now, how are you in your workplace? Are you the person who always come late and then you always complain? You know, the person who always has an issue against the management? That's not a good testimony. Why? Because that's not God's will. There's a verse. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, that says, For rebellion is as the sin of divination, a presumption as an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Uh, this verse was spoken to Saul, King Saul. At the time when it became really clear that God has replaced him with David, and he sort of showing this rebellious attitude. And God told him, your rebellion is equivalent to divination. The word divination is witchcraft. That's how dangerous rebellion is. Because God hates witchcraft. God hates divination. And God has said, but because you have rebelled and rejected me, then I have rejected you. Folks, it's important for us to understand that God relates to us according to how we relate to Him. If we have a rebellious attitude, then God takes it as you rejecting Him. And you don't want that, right? You don't want to continually have a rebellious attitude and act as if you are rejecting the Lord. Why? Because in the end, just like King Saul, you will have to be set aside and have someone in your place. Let's move to the last point. We have seen the duty of submission, the defense of submission. It's for our protection and welfare when we submit. The last is the delight in submission. Now, Peter would move to another section, beginning in verses 18 to 22. And the first part of verse 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Let me just stop there. Now, First section was submission to government. Now, submission to employers. 
In the contemporary culture, that phrase, servants be subject to your masters, it could be read in our time, Paul was addressing household servants, or Peter was addressing household servants, but today this is applicable to employees. So you're literally being told, employees, submit to your bosses. Now, let me ask you, how's your attitude towards your boss? Are you perceived as someone who's submissive or someone who's rebellious? Now, you might say, but, but pastor, you don't know my boss. My, my boss is really harsh. My boss is really rude. Now, let me tell you, Peter anticipated that response. That's why he continued in saying, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. So you're looking at me and saying, Pastor, is that really true? Even when my boss is harsh and rude, I should submit? Now, I'm not the one telling you this. It's God through Peter that even when your boss is not good, even when your boss is not gentle, you have to endure. Why? Because God has a way of using our suffering in order to mold our character. Now, I know that it's easier to just bail out and find another you know, job. That's possible, but it's never easy to find another job. And so, if you really believe that God is sovereignly in control of your situation, and that instead of show re showing rebellion, what the Bible is saying is you, so, you show submission, even when your boss is not the kind of person that you would easily submit to. Right? Because God, if you trust Him, can use your situations by staying there, by committing to endure, if you allow Him to be able to change your attitude through your situation. And if that's not enough, then Apostle Peter started giving an illustration. What's the illustration? Here, let's read beginning 21. It says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Now, this is really where I'd like to emphasize that idea of delighting in submission. Why? Because if you notice the highlighted phrase, it says, so that you might follow in his steps. If you're saying, oh, it's so hard for me to submit because of the kind of employer or boss I have. Now, Peter is saying, but Jesus Christ was willing to endure. He suffered unjustly. He doesn't deserve it. He did not commit any crime. And yet, he was willing to suffer because he was aware that God was trying to accomplish something out of that suffering. And for you and I to keep submitting, believing that God is able to accomplish His will in our lives, through our submission, we are willing to embrace suffering and, and be able to identify that our submission can bring blessings into our lives.
That's why it's a delight to submit when we know we are submitting to God despite the sufferings we have to endure. So Tuesday, you're going back to work. Right? And let's be practical. Because I know it's never easy to put ourselves under the authority of a person who is as imperfect as we are. That's the truth. But you know, if you're a believer, you have to see that there's a greater power behind. That He is sovereign in everything that is happening in your life. And that if you continue to read our text, verse 23 says, When He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but continued entrusting Himself to Him who judges justly. So, what the scripture is trying to help you understand is you could endure and suffer and believe that the just God would straighten it out in due time. Instead of threatening and responding as a carnal person, follow the Example of Jesus Christ. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He kept himself silent because, notice, he is trusting, he is entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Amen? So, I trust that this morning, you and I could be reminded Remember, it's God who established these human institutions. Government, family, church, employers, they're the human institutions. And our resolve is to submit rather than rebel. Let me close with these words by A.W. Tozer. He said these words, The reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. We are still giving some of the orders and we are still interfering with God's working within us. You see, the reason why we're stuck in the wilderness of life is because we keep interfering with God's work in our lives. Don't be tempted to keep calling the shots. You're not the one you're, who's supposed to call the shots. Your role is to submit. And in submission, you are entrusting yourself in the hands of of God, who would always, always judge justly. Amen? Let's pray. Lord,